Welcome back to another episode of Dear Found Her. I am excited beyond belief to have today's guest because she has been a darling in the press when it comes to female founders. She's everywhere if you Google her name, which she just told me she hasn't Googled her name in a while. She's recently <laughs> been on Shark Tank and she has an incredible company. So Kaylin Marcotte, founder of Jiggy, I am so excited that you're here. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us. Welcome to Dear Found Her. Thanks so much, Lindsay. I'm excited to talk to you. So kick us off and tell everyone first about your background and how you got to where you are, but also what is Jiggy? Yes. So uh, background, I was a political science major, really excited about kind of media and politics and thought I might go to law school. And I met two young co-founders in New York a couple of years out of college. I started in management consulting and then I met Carly and Danielle, who were the co-founders of The Skim, the daily email newsletter. And I had coffee with them and, and just knew I had to be a part of this. They had just started um, the daily email newsletter, The Skim. And so I joined them and that was my first kind of entrance into the startup world. And it was such an exciting time. It was like 20, end of 13, 14, 15 in New York City. There was just really this energy around um, the startup scene there and was so passionate about what we were doing. So it was an incredible experience. But it was also all consuming and very stressful. And my first, um, you know, kind of the, the startup pace and my first just 24-7 um, job that, you know, I was on screens all day long and I was starting to burn out. And so I was looking for just a way to unwind and unplug and you know, I'd, I'd be on screens all day, come home and then turn on the TV and try to just relax that way. And it just didn't feel right. It felt like more of the same and um, that I wasn't really getting what I was looking for and, and being more present and mindful. So, you know, tried yoga, tried meditation, some other things, nothing really clicked with me until I did a jigsaw puzzle. And I, you know, I have them lying around. It was kind of random at first, but then I did a puzzle and it really just clicked pretty immediately that this was an activity that, you know, was engaging enough. It really focused my mind um, and, and held my attention, but also made me feel just really grounded and present. And I felt very, um, you know, relaxed at the end. So it kind of became my form of stress relief. I was going through a thousand piece puzzle almost every single week. So I was also living in a studio apartment in New York. So I would just stack up the completed ones and slide them under my couch when I was done. But I was always looking for more and buying more, you know, online at a, a toy store on my walk home from the office. And uh, I just felt that they were all really outdated and kind of cheesy. And, you know, it was the same cardboard box that every puzzle ever made has come in and kind of, you know, grandma's puzzles, um, stock photography, the same kind of subject matter. And so the idea just planted, you know, back, back then, coming on eight years ago now that I wanted to elevate and modernize the classic puzzle. So started thinking about it more, you know, this one was kind of a slow burn story. I ended up staying at the skim for almost four years. So I had a lot of time just thinking about it, you know, getting more and more comfortable and confident in the idea in myself, and then ultimately launched Jiggy in 2019. And our model is that we partner with emerging female artists and turn their artwork into each of the puzzle designs. We do profit sharing, so they get a percentage of every sale. So that was kind of my, my pain point one. I wanted the designs to be more engaging and beautiful. You're spending 10, 8, 8 10, 12 hours with this image, you know, really living inside of it, studying every detail. And then two, I wanted the packaging to be more elevated, more of an experience. And so um, each jiggy comes in a reusable glass jar. And we include puzzle glue. And that was kind of step three. What do you do with a puzzle once you're done with it? And so our puzzle glue, once you're done with it, it, uh, it binds the pieces. You put it right on top. It, it dries clear and essentially turns the puzzle into an art print that you can then frame and actually display as art. So yeah, that's Jiggy. And we're about three years old now. So I want to just point out really quickly before we kind of get into like the nuts and bolts that 
you started this before the pandemic mm-hmm. <laughs> and like mm-hmm. what a like a I mean obviously the pandemic and the lockdown was not lucky for anyone but it was very lucky for your business I mean what seriously right I mean what did that do to elevate Jiggy probably faster than it then would have happened had people not been at home everyone was doing totally. puzzles yes Yes, it, it, you know, it, it was double edged in that it brought a lot. So, you know, it brought a lot of attention and, and just organic demand. Everyone was stuck at home looking for activities to pass the time. You know, puzzles have, there have been studies connecting them, you know, with um, PTSD and uh, improved memory and sleep and um, using like grief communities. And so, you know, especially during that time when there was just so much collective anxiety or people quarantining alone and a lot of loneliness. Um, so puzzles were really, you know, just on the lighter side, a way to, to have fun and pass the time and kind of on the deeper side, you know, really a tool to, um, to combat some of the things that, that were happening during the pandemic. And so it definitely brought a lot of yeah, just organic demand and attention. It also brought a lot of supply chain issues and freight and logistics. And, you know, we had done basically one production run before COVID. So we were still figuring everything out for the first time, basically just, you know, shoring up working, building relationships with our, with our vendors. And uh, so to be thrown into this world where it was a constantly moving target and, you know, sold out, yeah, maybe that's a good problem to have in the scheme, but like, that's still a problem. And yeah. it still, you know, brought a lot of anxiety to know I'm, I'm a young company. I'm trying to grow and be relevant. And how do I do that when I have no product to sell? So it was a whirlwind for sure. So I want to go back to pre-pandemic and pre that first run that you just talked about. And I'd love for you to kind of first and foremost, dive in a little bit to the whole manufacturing process, because you have a product that obviously is a manufactured product and that comes with costs, that comes with Mm -hmm. logistics, that comes with operations. Mm -hmm. And so for a founder who's listening, who maybe has an idea for a product, how do you get that ball rolling? Yeah. So it's, it was looking back one of like, for me, the most interesting kind of times because I was really winging it. And again, coming from the skim, I had been in a startup environment, but it was all digital and media. And, and, you know, this was my first physical product experience. And so um, some things were certainly transferable and some things were brand new. So had this idea started, um, you know, kind of sketching out or or working with some materials. I taped, you know, some uh, just printed out like a design I liked and tried to tape it on and what shape would I want the box to be and realized like I had a bit of a vision. I still wanted to, to hone it, but I also had no idea how to get that vision to like a, you know, a production ready CAD file that a factory could print off of. And so basically I went on LinkedIn and I found, you know, luckily in New York, there are a ton of um, schools and students specializing in this. So I found a, the School of Visual Arts. I found a, a grad who had done product design at, um, at SBA. And so started working with her and we kind of mocked up a few different uh, options and tried to kind of build them together. And then, um, and then finding the, so one was, you know, getting, getting the the vision and the files ready. And then two was finding somebody to make it. And that was, I mean, for someone out there, I don't think it's, it's, it's my next passion to tackle, but somebody should like how to connect brands with the right manufacturer and, um, and make that a more seamless process because it still feels incredibly old school. Um, you know, there's no like directory. I was kind of naive and just like, oh, I want to make a thing. There are factories that make things. Like, how hard can that be? But it's very relationship driven, especially when you're pre-launch, pre-revenue. Like the, you know, you you be, they have to take a bet on you basically, and you have to convince them that it's even worth. Uh, their time to, you know, fire up the machines and, and, and do it for what in the beginning is, 
usually a pretty small quantity by their terms. Um, so it ended up being through a mutual connection. I tried to find some online and um, the biggest thing I was running into was minimum order quantities. You know, I was going to, I was self-funding the business. And so I had some, you know, of just my personal savings to put in, but couldn't, um, couldn't do the, you know, the runs they were talking about. And so I just kept talking to people until finally one, you know, at first had said no to me. And then, um, and then, you know, kind of just put his arms up and was like, okay, let's try this. I'll do, I'll do your first run and we can take it from there. Um, and so, you know, in each of our, uh, so that was for the puzzles, the printed materials, the box and the puzzles themselves. But then this vision I had of really elevating it, um, involved a bunch of other components so the glass jar I mentioned that the pieces come in and the puzzle glue and the glue has to go in a tube and I didn't want to use plastic so I found an aluminum tube supplier but by the way their minimum was 300,000 units and oh my I was God. like I want like max 10 if I can eke that out and they you know but we came to a compromise and I think really you know for anyone out there who's navigating this process, um, really, you know, coming up with creative solutions and, and with them, they were essentially like, you know, they were explaining to me, like, it's just not worth it to us to, to staff the factory. And I was like, all right, what if the next time you have one of those massive runs, you just like tack me onto the end. And they were like, okay, I think we could do that. But you then have no control over the timeline. Like we can't guarantee when that will be. So if you're willing to kind of compromise an in-hand date for, you know, for this price. And um, and so ultimately, you know, the next time they had a big order, they just put my tiny project on onto the end of it. Um, and so that's how we got around the minimums there. But it was a process for sure. And there is definitely opportunity for someone to make this easier. When you first launched were you direct to consumer only? Yeah, that was the idea. You know, set up my Shopify, um, use one of their templates and, and just built it myself. And so, yeah, I wanted to, again, I was self-funding. I, I, I had an idea of what it could become, but really kind of wanted to and had to just de-risk it early on. And just, I was like, all right, you know, kind of the scrappy, quick and dirty, set up the site, you know, let's, um, let's see that I can prove out there's an appetite before I go all in. So it was D to C on our, on our own site. So what was that pivot, that moment that kind of took you from that small self-funded D to C to what you are today? I mean, you are sold in retailers, you have a massive business, many partnerships, what was that moment? Yeah, it happened and it started happening before the pandemic and then it really escalated it. So I launched, you know, November, 2019 and by January of 2020, so, you know, two months in, um, I had started and during that holiday season, you know, I was, I was trying to gift, you know, contacting influencers and celebrities and I just asking so many favors of all my friends and, and family and having everyone post and try to amplify it and kind of create that first um, kind of buzz out of the gate. And so I, you know, was, was building up our social media and it was actually through Instagram that kind of a, a product scout buyer at Anthropology reached out and she so this was, you know, we were already talking before the pandemic. And then once, um, once that happened, they were like, I think there, I think this could be a, you know, a bigger thing this year. And it was, the idea was to launch for holidays of 2020 and, you know, Q4 2020. And so, um, you know, it went from just, we'd like to, you know, potentially carry you to like, let's make Jiggy kind of a, the, the gift of the season here at Anthro. And so, um, yeah, I remember I got, got the email, got on the phone call and then 
packed up some samples in my car, rented a car, you know, I don't have a car in New York, drove down from, from New York to Philly where they're headquartered and met in person. And it just totally clicked. And they, you know, basically said back to me all kind of my, uh, my pitch points about how, um, you know, it's this activity, but it also can be art and how the anthro shopper, you know, wants the, the function, but needs the the design and wants the aesthetic too. And we just had a great conversation about it. And they do a lot to support artists and they have a whole kind of artists in residence program in-house. And so um, they, they have a ton of incredible art already. So we decided to do an exclusive design, a, a line for them of seven custom designs using their in-house art. And, um, and yeah, so we launched that. And so that was the first kind of moment that I was like, all right, you know, there's, um, there's a bigger appetite for this. And then, you know, both the, the D to C was growing. That was our first retail count and it ended up being, you know, 215 stores and, and national e-com included. So, um, yeah, end of year one, I was like, all right, it's time to sprint. Well, so I want to talk a little bit about marketing because you have your product is puzzles. It's not like it's an invention. You didn't, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, you have beautiful packaging. You have, it comes with glue to make it into a beautiful art piece. There are definitely unique selling points, but at the heart of what you sell, it's puzzles. And so I want you to kind of talk about how you got the word out. And yes, you were talking about building your social media, but I think that the biggest challenge I hear from founders is the lack of marketing budget. You know, people are bootstrapping, you are bootstrapping, you know, how can you make an impact with little revenue? Because Mm -hmm. that is, that is such a challenge, especially for businesses that, that are not funded. Yes, completely. And I think the, um, yeah, marketing on a you know cash flow driven budget um, is is really an art and science, but um, but it's possible, and you prove it is that I I prove that you know completely possible, and I think it really you know as with many things requires if you're not going to just throw money at the problem, like it requires some more creativity and some more legwork, and I think coming from a really authentic place. I think that's really important if you are going to be relying on more kind of grassroots or community driven approaches, then you have to know kind of what you stand for, what your, what your brand means. Um, And so, you know, right out of the gate, it was kind of baked in that we had these this network of the artists who we were partnering with. And so, you know, it's a, it's a um, percentage of sales model. So they're obviously incentivized to share and drive sales as well. So, you know, day one, it was not just me pushing the word, but it was all of these artists that we were working with. So that's, you know, one thing I think people can think about of what their version of that is. How can you almost bake into the product itself you know, some community or another audience that would be incentivized um, to, to help and make sure it succeeds. So, you know, we had our artist community and definitely relying on them to, to help support not only through sharing to their networks, but create content, you know, I mean, you know, social media, it's just the, the pace that you need to, um, be keeping up with content wise uh, can be exhausting for a a one woman team. And so, you know, having them share their stories, not only is it totally authentic to our mission, it also just helps alleviate some of the work on me to, to be constantly churning out content. So having the artists share their stories. So right out of the gate, it was, you know, me just hitting the, the, you know, pounding the pavement with trying to, to activate my network. Um, all of the artists that we were partnered with activating their networks. Um, You know, I think PR, certainly you can outsource and pay for. I think there's a lot more you can do yourself than than people might, you know, immediately realize or or try. Um, So we, uh, you know, writing, and I think it's like nice to hear from the founder. So you know, run your pitch email by a couple people, but 
have that pitch email, do, do it yourself. Um, you know, email lists like Haro help a reporter out are always putting out prompts of people looking for things. So, um, you know, signing up for those and just keeping a pulse on, on it and what the opportunities are. Um, you know, of course, organic social, we didn't turn on paid until I want to say like a year and a half in probably a year and a half, two years in. Um, so there's a lot you can do with, you know, just organic social DM it. And why not? Like we did a partnership with Sophia Bush and it came from DMing her, you know? And so, um, just reaching out again, doing it in an authentic way. Um, but, but it's really, I think if you're, if you don't have dollars to throw that it's just, it's the legwork. Um, and I think of course the, the product has to be good. And, and once you get it into hands, you know, it has to, it has to do the work from there. Um, but I would say, you know, organic social starting to do your own PR, um, if there's another community or audience or, you know, our version of our artists that you can help build in and activate, you know, even if it's an early kind of ambassador program, which is one thing that I had experience with at the skim is we launched skim ambassadors and, you know, they, it was huge. They were responsible for one point for like 20% of the company's growth. And it was just finding your 1%, you know, who are, um, that, that 1% of engaged, um, customers or users who who you can then kind of harness and and activate in some way. Um, so those were kind of the the early things in the beginning. Now post COVID, you know, we had started doing events, which we then stopped for a while. But starting now um, to do in person stuff. So we do puzzle parties and you know work with um, hospitality spaces or kind of membership clubs. Like here in New York, I do Soho House, and you know basically when I was just working, you know, launching the brand, worked out of Soho House every day. So I was like, hey guys, would you host like a, a launch puzzle party for me and let's invite all the members. And so um, I think getting exposure that way. And I, I actually wouldn't underestimate for people with a physical product, starting to do kind of the market circuit, whether it's pop-ups or, you know, we're, right now we're in the Union Square holiday market, because not only is it just a ton of foot traffic and great, um, just, you know, top, top level visibility, but you also get to have such a pulse on what the feedback is, you know, do your pitch and see when the aha moment, like what resonates, when do people's eyes light up, what, what makes it click, because that can then help your digital messaging as well, you know, when you've tested a few things on, on a lot of people. And talking to human beings is a very important part of feedback on your business. Totally. You know, it's funny. I, your story very much reminds me of another founder we had on. Her name is Chrissy Fitchell. She founded Apotheke and she okay. made like soaps out of her kitchen. Yeah. And she was at the Brooklyn flea. She like got into the Brooklyn flea cool. and she was discovered by West Elm. And so, um, she has a wow. very similar story. It took a little bit longer for her, but she, you know, now has their own factory. They do candles. I have one That's behind insane. me. Um, but in very much like what you just said, you know, was, you know, getting into these markets first and foremost. And um, Laura Schaeferman also from Legally Addictive. That's how she started mm. as well, um, which is very interesting. But mm -hmm. one of the things that I just want to make sure we are reiterating and pointing out to what you just said is something that I talk about all the time here on the podcast and on social media is the power of partnerships. They're free. And just mm -hmm. like your artist network, how do you, how do you, the listener find that artist network or the equivalent of, and you just said right. that. And I think that it's important to point that out because to have those partnerships out of the gate and then for the long term as well is really what's going to help you grow and continue to grow. Um, like when I had started Bump Club and Beyond, partnerships were a key part of our marketing strategy until the day I left. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had been acquired at that point, but partnerships mm -hmm. were still where it all was in terms of growth. You said it, find someone's audience that you can borrow and be a part of. And those mm -hmm. are really key points that I do think a lot of times entrepreneurs and founders overlook the simplicity of what really works. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, think, I mean, cause that, that works and it's not it hard. Does. It does. It, it does. And I think the, you know, what, and I, 
I think it's kind of a, a blessing in disguise having started a little bit later because I remember some founder friends in, you know, peak like 2016 to 19 when it was just like the Facebook ad machine, you know, you raise enough VC money, you pump it into Facebook, there you go, you have a DVC brand, you know, and I think um, in some ways, like, yeah, that's not a sure thing anymore. And so um, we have to be more creative, but it's also so much more interesting than just serving up Facebook ads. And I think, um, you know, the 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 easy thing that people think of is still kind of I think performance marketing, but partnerships. But there well, has yes. been such a shift to going it's back to partnerships and brand awareness strategies and grassroots marketing, Completely. and especially just given the monopoly that Meta has over everything, and I think that brands very much want to own their own data and their own strategies yes. and their own tactics and have control versus relying on an algorithm to serve up their product to people. And so I, I definitely think that they're like, thank God you did start a little bit later because your product would have been probably a little bit different. You would have had a different trajectory yes. had you been part of that like D to C, you know, ad funnel pumping yes. machine. Completely, right? completely. And I think it's, it, it, it has forced more interesting, you know, iterations and on our partnerships, of course, you know, we have our artist partnerships, but on the B2B side of partnerships, you know, it's been such kind of a joy and it's part of my mission with JV to bring puzzles out of kind of that, the toy and game aisle only and more into lifestyle and gifting and wellness and, you know, mindfulness and okay, you can't meditate, you know, try this and to, to kind of surprise and delight with putting puzzles where you might not expect to see them. And so some of those, you know, we worked with the flower company books and it was um, okay, you know, Valentine's day might look a little different during the pandemic. So what if we do a date night in bundle where you get a bouquet of flowers and you get this beautiful custom puzzle that we made for them. And so, you know, things like that of getting us in front of um, an audience, especially when you, you know, go for partners that are really aligned in, in demographic or messaging or, um, or kind of brand mission and values. And you, that audience that you're then getting in front of is so much more kind of curated and high intent than, you know, just blasting ads or, or some other way that might not be as um, kind of pre, pre-filtered and pre-curated for you than working with a really well-aligned brand. So let, I want to turn our attention really quickly to the elephant in the room. If someone Googles you and that, is, <laughs> and that is Shark Tank because you yeah. were on Shark Tank mm -hmm. and that's a very big deal. Congratulations. Thank you. And um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that experience, how it came about and share with our listeners what happened. Yeah. So um, I was contacted. So it turns out, you know, you can, they have in-person casting, they have video submissions, and then it turns out about a third of the companies that ultimately go on, they've, you know, the producers have, have scouted and reached out to. So that's what happened in my case. Um, they found Jiggy reached out and, uh, this was also right before, um, the pandemic, actually, we were super early and, you know, I was like, I, I think that could be a big opportunity, but I'm also a one woman show. And I feel like it also could be a huge distraction or just a ton of work. And I'm not um, sure I can take that on right now. Maybe when we're, we were also like less than six months old. And so, um, so I was a little unsure and then, and then the pandemic happened and we sold out and I was like, oh man, I am, you know, sprinting right now. It might one be nice to have a partner, Two, there's more attention on this product and category than ever. Like what, it seems like a real window of opportunity. So decided to go on and, and from there, you know, following the same ton of, of video pitches and, you know, get signed a, a producing team. And so really kind of, they do a great job of walking you through how to prepare. Um, it was, we filmed, you know, during real, still height of COVID and so, I, they set up a bubble environment and rebuilt the entire stage in Las Vegas. 
So I went out to Vegas and, and quarantined in a hotel room for 14 days, which, you know, a lot of people have a co-founder or like bring someone else on. I was, you know, still solo at the time. So yeah, I felt like, um, like true isolation in a, in a hotel room in Vegas, but had plenty of time to get all my friends to pretend to be sharks and do zooms with me and practice. Um, and then ultimately, filmed and then it's kind of a, a waiting game you know you you wait to hear you obviously know what happened on the show and so you you immediately start getting introduced to the Sharks team if you do make a deal um, I got an offer from Mark Cuban and so you know right after the show you connect with the team start doing diligence and all that and then kind of just wait until um, until you hear about airing and ultimately I got my air date spring um, of 2021. And so then you get like two to three weeks notice. So it's like, all right, you know, time to, to prep the site, make sure, you know, we're good. The servers won't go down. Okay, get the email list ready. Um, okay, how's inventory looking? You know, get let the fulfillment center now. So um, that was that was a lot of fun. Definitely a whirlwind, just prepping, and then and then you have your air night, which was incredible. We had such amazing feedback and support, and I went home. My family had like a viewing party for me, so I was with my whole family watching it. Um, and did they then, know? Did my family know? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they knew. Um, they, yeah, I had been living at home for part of COVID. So it was like, they saw me through the whole process. Um, and then, yeah, so it airs and really, you know, I think the immediate thing people think about is the, um, like, you know, customer, the audience watching and the, the, the customer response. And so that is definitely, you know, really powerful, the immediate traffic to the site and sales and email signups. Um, but then there are a lot of other people that watch Shark Tank. And so other investors start reaching out and, you know, retailers and potential partners, other brands. So um, there were kind of some other tangential impacts that I didn't necessarily think of, but that just brought a lot of opportunity and opened a ton of doors. Um, and then being part of the kind of Shark Tank community, there's a really nice, there's actually like a, a, a you know, group of, of Shark Tank alum companies who then you have, you have such a unique shared experience and, you know, most are, um, are, are in the same general size and, you know, dealing with very much the same things, physical product, you know, supply chains and, and logistics and all of that. So share a lot of resources, ask each other questions, support. Um, so, so being a part of kind of the Shark Tank family of brands has been a really nice experience too. So it was wild, but, um, but all in all, really, really glad I did it. Congratulations. Thank it's you. really amazing. Like your whole story is really amazing. I would love for you to share with us now just a little bit about your growth and where your company is now. And I know we're not going to get into revenue numbers and that's fine, but tell us how big are you? Yeah. So we're, I mean, our team is still tiny. We're three people full time. And then we have a great kind of group of freelancers and, and contractors and stuff, but we're three full time. Um, and, you know, really, I think our the biggest growth has been in just our channels. And so we went from, you know, just small D to C on our own website to now we have essentially three main pillars of the business. One is still D to C that has expanded beyond um, just the, the original puzzles that we launched with. We now have adults and Jiggy Jr., which is our kids line. Um, we also launched frame pairing. So, you know, because each one includes a puzzle glue, we get a lot of questions about framing. So we have Jiggy frames that are um, that are custom made and, and perfectly fit to the puzzles. Um, and then we saw such kind of strong repeat. And it is, you know, you do a puzzle once, they're kind of addicting. And, um, and since that was the whole idea and really organic to my founding story of it being um, my habit and really being my kind of self-care ritual, we started a puzzle club, which is a monthly membership. So now we have, you know, a bunch of different offerings um, on the D2C side. 
and then wholesale and retail relationships. So we're now in Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, Macy's.com, um, uh, Anthro, um, and we've done some more of those just off our line sheet and some custom. So Bloomingdale's was actually the first partner we did a Jiggy Jr. the kids design for and commissioned one of our artists to make a custom for them celebrating their New York, you know, Lex Ave, 59th Street iconic storefront. Um, and then lastly, which, you know, has really taken off. I thought there would be interest in it, but it's really taken off pretty organically is our B2B um, custom, which is, you know, corporate gifting or brand collabs, celebrating a new product launch um, or creating a custom that brands will, will do as an upsell or bundle, gift with purchase, things like that. So that's opened up um, such an amazing way to, to build these partnerships, get in front of new audiences, again, position puzzles where it might be a bit more unexpected or, you know, for example, when we did last year, um, Casey Musgraves, the music artist was launching a new album. And so we put her album cover art on a puzzle and that was sold alongside, you know, the merch celebrating the album release. Obviously you're doing something with your hands when you're puzzling. So I usually do listen to music or an audio book. Um, so a nice kind of pairing for an audio experience to have a physical puzzle to do. Um, so yeah, we are now, you know, multi-million dollar business with three strong um, revenue channels and, and uh, still learning a ton, trying new stuff and have kept it scrappy with our team of three. Did you ever think when you were begging for those manufacturing <laughs> plants to tack to you make, on at the end of the, the run know. that this is where you'd be this quick? It's really the speed. You, you're right. I, you know, I thought there might be, I was like, I saw the adult coloring book fad and some of these other things. And I was like, why couldn't it be puzzles? I think, you know, I think I could be the one to do it. And since I was such a puzzle, avid puzzler, it came from such an organic place that I was like, I think there's an appetite and I think I could be the one to do it. Um, but the, you know, the, the speed and every milestone we hit, you know, I'm definitely kind of fall into the, the founder, you know, um, uh, speed where by the time we hit a milestone, I'm already on to the next one and barely even take a minute to celebrate that one. Cause I'm, you know, sprinting to the next. Um, but when I do have those moments to just stop and look back and have such wonderful kind of support system and friends and family who sometimes just reflect back to me, what, you know, what the last three years have been. And it is, it is pretty incredible. And I think really goes to show, you know, and to your point, yes, it's puzzles. I, that's another thing. Sometimes I say to people who might be wanting to do something or looking for their idea that I think there's a lot of emphasis sometimes on like, you know, zero to one, like, like these tech unicorns, some, you have to build something that's never existed before. Sometimes I'm like, it might be right in front of you. And it's just, you know, what's your unique spin? What's your different take on it? Or, um, or how would you, how would you do it your way and differently, but um, start with something that's really organic and it might be yeah right in front of you this whole time so I have one more question for you it's the yes. question I ask everyone at the end and I would love for you to share three pieces of actionable advice that you would give to another female founder yes I would definitely say start as soon as you have an idea have you know the desire um I would start with just building the audience I think you know, start the social handles, start, you know, throw up a very basic landing page with a wait list that collects emails. And I think it's really helpful to, to set yourself up to not have day one be a complete cold start. Um, and I think there are, you know, behind the scenes content, there's stuff you can show and start building pre-launch. So I would say one, just do yourself a favor and start, um, you know, getting, getting ahead um, I would say to really think about what the, what the community version looks like to you. Is it your customers? Is it collaborators for us, our artists? Like what are the, um, relationships or, or communities or pockets that you can bring into your brand and, 
um, and kind of have them alongside you, incentivize to, to help you grow um, and you know spread your reach. I think especially as solo founders or small teams, um, it's you know give yourself as as wide breadth as you can, and so think about what community means to your brand. Um, and then three, I would just say like keep keep kind of your your um, it's not even work life balance, but find the kind of split that works for you. In the beginning of Jiggy, I tried to be um, kind of multitask everything, I guess. And I, you know, within the same day, I try to, okay, be, be a great daughter and friend and call my mom and catch up with everyone and then be a good, you know, CEO and do all of these things. And I found that actually, rather than trying to have, you know, every day balanced, I kind of do sprints where, you know, this, this two week stretch, like, I'm going to almost alleviate myself of the pressure of trying to be a good friend or daughter or, or fiance and like just set clear expectations, guys, and going off the grid for, you know, I'm in a jiggy sprint right now. And then really disconnect when I'm doing the opposite and when I'm recharging myself and, you know, giving to, to my relationships, then I don't feel bad about not checking Slack or not checking email. And I think sometimes this expectation that um, we can, you know, we have to, to be play all the roles in our lives at the same time. Um, and that that's what balance and, and work-life balance looks like. And I just found for me that, um, that I, it's much easier, I'm a great unitasker and doing one thing well at a time, um, makes me feel more fulfilled and productive than, uh, than trying to play every role at once. Kaylin Marcotte, founder of Jiggy. Thank you so much for sharing your story here. This was amazing. There are Thank so you. many awesome takeaways for myself and for our community here. And I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. And I hope Thank that you, you take a minute to be proud of yourself as well, especially going into a new year. So congrats and thank you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.